Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our second day in daily devotions together. I'm glad that you've uh, joined me here. It looks like a lot of you did yesterday. I hope you've got yourself a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or some other caffeine-laden drink, uh, and you're ready to dive into God's Word with me this morning. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, I just want you to understand that what's happening here this morning is not me preaching to you. It's not me teaching you. It's just simply you joining me in this devotional time as I look into God's Word and as I try to gain some insight uh, from the passage that I'm reading today. So our passage this morning is Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to continue exactly where we were yesterday. Um, and we were looking at the opening paragraph of Philippians 1, which goes right from verse 1 right through to verse 11. And we're looking at this, this small portion right at the end of that uh, intro, introduc introduction. So just to kind of go over things again, the way we, um, the format we're using here today is, first of all, I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit to illumine uh, my mind and your minds to understand what the Word of God says. And then we're going to read this passage together. At that point, I'll make a number of uh, comments, uh, just kind of reflect on what I'm seeing in the, in the, uh, pa the passage. Uh, I basically follow the, the format of observation, interpretation, application. I'm going to observe what the text says, I'm going to try to interpret what the text says, and then try to make application to my own life and to your lives also. And then uh, that will be the bulk of our, of our time. And then the final thing is just simply a prayer that God will help us to apply this text to our lives today. Just one other note uh, before we dive into the text. Uh, don't forget that this goes Monday through Friday, but on Friday is a special time, a Q&A. So if you have questions about a passage, this passage, or uh, anything that we study throughout the week, uh, or if you have just any kind of general qu question that you'd like answered from the Bible, uh, you need to get those into me by Wednesday. You can email them to me, uh, and then uh, I'd be happy to deal with those on Friday morning. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this new day that you've given to us. We are grateful that your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never end. They are truly new every morning. Your faithfulness to us is so great. And so, Father, we want to begin this day with you. We're asking that you will give us this day our daily bread. You will grant us again the wonderful gift of the Spirit's illumination, so that the word that he breathed out might find place in our hearts today, so that we can begin this day and live this day to the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so Philippians chapter 1. Yesterday we read verses 1 through 11, and we're just going to go back now to verse 9 and start there. Just two verses to read today. Uh, Paul writes, And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, my, my original plan was to start at verse 12 today, but um, as we went through this passage yesterday morning, uh, it became clear to me that there was so much more in verses 9 through 11, and we really didn't have time to dissect what it was actually saying. There's a lot here in the content of Paul's, Paul's prayer, which I want to look at today. Um, it's really clear to me that, that this prayer that he, uh, uh, that he speaks here in verse 9 through 11 actually flows out of everything that he says in the introductory words that precede it. Uh, he's talking about having them in his mind. He, he's talking about having the Philippian believe, believers in his prayers and in his heart. And I think this whole idea of, of Paul having this deep affection for these believers that he's separated from is, is, is the, the, the logical flow in this passage. What is on his mind, what is on his heart, flows naturally into what he is going to pray. So he's already said that they are in his prayers and now in verse 9, he specifically tells them uh, what, he's, what he was praying for them. And again, this flows out of verse uh, 5. Because of your partnership or your fellowship 
in the gospel, the gospel because we share this common life in Jesus which the gospel tells us about there is this natural flow of wanting to pray verse 8 says God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus um, one of the things that came to my mind yes yesterday and I didn't have time to share it was that Paul reminds me here of uh, what we read about in Exodus chapter 28 and um, you know in the Exodus series I've not got that far yet but I've been reading ahead and in Exodus chapter 28 um, God gives to Moses inst instructions about the clothing that the high priest is supposed to wear when he goes into the tent of meeting to offer sacrifice on behalf of the, pe the people and one of the one of the, the the articles of clothing that they would the high priest would put on was a thing called an ephod. Uh, an interesting word. Uh, just it simply it simply was this um, uh, like a shoulder garment that he would put on. It would it would cover the upper part of his of his torso of the high the high priest. And woven into that garment were two onyx stones. And those onyx stones had on them the names of the 12 sons of Jacob so the names of the 12 tribes were there and Aaron would go into the tent of meeting uh, with these names on him as it were on his heart I think that's just a, a beautiful pic picture of what we're seeing here that um, that that we are to have God's people on our hearts and we're to bring God's people before the Lord. Uh, verses 9 through 11, I think, are the climax to what he's saying here in these opening verses. And, and um, as I look at these verses, I think there's two things. We, we're seeing here how Paul prayed and what Paul prayed. And I think the question that I would ask myself and all of you today is, is this how we pray? When we pray for others, when we pray for each other, are we praying the way Paul prayed? So um, let's look at a couple of things here because I think they're very important. This is more than just praying for our daily needs or praying for the ministry of the church. He says here, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So the, the first thing he's praying about is love, love. Uh, I want you to notice um, he, he doesn't give us an object for this love that your love may abound more and more so what's he talking about is he is he talking about love for God is he talking about love for each other uh, he doesn't say but the fact that he uses the word abound makes me think that he's really talking about both things in other words there's so much of an abundance of this love that it, 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 it's vertical and horizontal in nature. It's like a volcano. It just overflows. It's love to God and it's love to each other. Of course, this would tie in with, with how Paul would understand God's word and the law. Um, it, would under, it, it, it would tie in very clearly with uh, the fact that uh, the law is, sum, is summarized with loving God and loving others or loving our neighbor. Uh, the greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and also to love our neighbor as ourselves. The greatest of these is love, says Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter thir thir 13. So notice that the love here that he's talking about is not an uninformed love. It's not this kind of an undescribed love. It's not... Um, a all you need is love kind of love or a love is blind kind of love this is this is this is an informed love he's talking about growing in knowledge so that your love may abound more and more in knowledge the more we know God the more we should love God um, I, I quoted um, Thomas Aquinas a few weeks ago in the uh, series on Exodus um, that Thomas Aquinas said that love is born of an earnest consideration of the object love. In, in other words, love follows knowledge 
And I think, I don't know about you, but I think this is our greatest need. Right at this time, as this pandemic is spreading all around the world, just hearing today that the numbers are way up over 800,000 people. And um, as this thing is spreading and as people are being affected by it, um, we think that our greatest need is money. We think our greatest need is safety. But I think our greatest need is love. Love for God. Our greatest need is to know God. And we need to be thinking rightly about the God who we know. Christian love is not a sentimental kind of a love. Christian love is a, is a love that comes from, from the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And, and the Holy Spirit brings to us through the Word an even greater revelation of Jesus and who God really is. So the more that we are in the Word of God, the more we are understanding the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this triune God who we love and serve is, is the one we need to know more and more. And I think the more we learn about God, then that gives us fresh reasons to even love Him more. Now he talks here about this love, and he adds this line in verse uh, 9, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge. And then he says, and depth of insight. That's an interesting thing here. In other words, this insight, he's talking here about something that informs the way in which we live. It's, it's practical insight for daily life. And he says, um, depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best. What is best. <sighs> life is really a series of choices that we make. And we know that what we choose today can actually shape the course of our lives in the coming the coming days. There's a trajectory to the choices that we make. Some of the choices we face in life are, are very small. Um, they're just little things. Some choices and decisions we make in life are huge. But if you decide to buy a house, Andrea and I did in 2008 when we moved here. We bought this house in Mount Hope. And really, that decision to buy that house has shaped our lives right up until today. For 12 plus years, our lives have been shaped by that decision to buy that particular house. And, and uh, we all make choices on a daily basis. And we want to make sure that the choices we make are the best ones. Um, little choices can determine the spiritual vitality of our lives because they govern the bigger choices that we make. I think what Paul is saying here is that if, if, if our lives are overflowing with love for God, if we're growing in our knowledge of God, then we will be able to choose the things that are really best, to choose the best things over the good, to choose the best things um, over the other kinds of priorities we have we have in life. And isn't this what we all need? Isn't this what we as parents need, as leaders need? Uh, we, want our, we want our kids to, to make the right choices, to do that which is best, to live in a way in which the choices they make are influencing the trajectory of their lives. And we know that the little choices that they make, foolish choices, wrong choices, that they make or we make, can have a real detrimental effect upon us. And so this knowledge of God and this love for God which should overflow, this is what we should be praying for, for ourselves, because that love, that knowledge enables us then uh, to make the best choices in life. Notice that, that the prayer kind of ends with that you may be pure, verse 10, pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness, that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Um, two times in this passage, the Apostle Paul mentions the second coming of the Lord Jesus. The first time was in verse 6, where he uh, talks about being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. So that's the first reference, and here in verse 10, a second reference to the day of 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a reference, of course, to the second coming. And this seems to be the thing that really shapes the Apostle Paul's prayer. This is his great goal, and it should be our great goal too, that we're going to stand before Jesus, as he says here, pure and blameless. That means morally transparent, free from any kind of stumbling at all, and that we will be filled, it says here, with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Here he's talking not just about the character of our lives, but the godly deeds, the fruit of righteousness that should be in all of our lives. The, the righteousness he's talking about here is not that imputed righteousness that is given to us when we believe in the Lord Jesus and are justified by faith, but rather this is the, this is the fruit of that justification. It's the, it's the, the fruit of righteous living. So we should be thinking here of things like the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That really is the fruit of righteousness, love, joy, peace, patience, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, those kinds of things. So this is what Paul prayed for. Uh, this is how he prayed. And I, I think we see here that this is how we should be praying too. That's really the application point. Uh, we're spending a lot of time in our homes now. You have time to pray. And today you're going to have time to pray. After you watch this, you're going to have time to pray. And I want you to pray. And I want you to focus on this prayer. And I think we should be praying for each other because this is a part of our fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think what we have here is relevant for all of us. And uh, we, need to, we need to be praying for lots of things. I, I'm sure all of us are praying about our financial si situation at this time. Uh, we're praying for our health. We're praying we'll be kept safe. We're praying for our kids that they too will enjoy health and be safe. But more than anything else, if we follow the example of Paul here, we need to be praying for love to overflow, for an increase in our knowledge of God, that God will give us depth of insight so that we will make the right choices. And those we pray for will make the right choices that will be pure, that will be kept from sin, that there'll be this fruit of righteousness in our own, our own lives. This is all a part of our fellowship in the, God, the gospel. Let's pray together now. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much that we could be together as a church body for this short period of time this, this morning. And now, Lord, we want to obey what we see here in your word, and we want to pray for each other. And Lord, I'm asking that this uh, emphasis on prayer will continue throughout this day and throughout all of the times in which we are separated from each other and even beyond, that we will be praying for each other, that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And so I pray for your people at West Highland today. I thank you for them. I thank you for every remembrance that I have of them. I thank you, Lord, for, for the partnership in the gospel that we share, for the, the grace of God that we share with each other. And I thank you, Lord, for the affection that you've put, put in my heart for your people. And I know that those who I'm praying with today are feeling the same thing. Lord, we're sort of like Aaron today. We're coming into your presence today, and we've got, we've got the names of the 12 tribes on us. We've got the names of the people of West Highland on our hearts, and we're praying for your people today that they will grow in this love, and they, they, will, they will so be guided by a depth of insight that comes from you and from your word that they will be able to discern what is best, that your people will be making the right choices, particularly at this time when we're going through this pan pandemic. And I pray, oh God, that you will not lead us into temptation, but that we may be pure and blameless until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, this pandemic reminds us of the signs of the times, that, that Christ is going to come again. And when he does, we want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own, but that which comes through Christ. Uh, we want to be found in him and living for him and abounding in his love for ourselves, for each other, and uh, 
and most importantly for you. And so, Lord, we pray that you will fill us today with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And we pray that in our lives today, all the glory and the praise will go to you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow for our third time of daily devotions. God bless you all this day.